Um, G'day everyone, my name is Glenn and welcome to Documentation is UX. Um, if you have difficulty understanding me or you want me to repeat something, feel free, I won't be offended. I'm, I'm happy to take questions today, although I will have trouble seeing you because I can't see very far with my glasses on. So if I don't answer straight away, it's because you're a blob and I can't see very well. So this talk is called Documentation is UX and much like my daughter in this picture here, I hold this opinion very loudly as well. Um, we all probably know what documentation is, but what is UX? What is user experience? So of course we search Wikipedia and we find the following reference. According to the Nissan Norman Group, user experience includes all of the aspects of the interactions between the end user with the company, its services and its products. Which is okay. Uh, there's the very comprehensive definition of ISO 9241 which defines the user experience as a user's perceptions and responses that result from the use and or anticipated use of a system, product or service. According to the ISO definition, user experience includes all of the user's emotions, beliefs, preferences, perceptions, physical and psychological responses, behaviours and accomplishments that occur before, after and during use. This list also lists three factors which influence user experience, which is the user, the, the system and the context of use. That's a big list of stuff. Um, you know, emotions, beliefs, preferences, perceptions, before, during, and after use. I mean, it makes sense. A user's, a user's perception of a thing will affect their experience when they use it. So if you're told that an app has a bad UX and you use it for the first time, you're going to assume that it has a bad UX. But importantly, there is no mention of a user interface in that definition. Because while the user interface is an important part of the experience, it is not the only part of the experience. So no matter whether an application is a mobile app or a website or a CLI tool, the principles of UX design still broadly apply. So let's look at some basic UX patterns in graphical user interfaces. This is a screenshot of a well-known and possibly local retail company. It's pretty busy with lots of things to look at, but have a look at the top left there. What are those three horizontal lines for? And this is the audience participation part. Hamburgers, what do they do? Very good, it opens up a menu. This is the PowerShell 7.3 documentation site, and again in the top left, there's this small v. What does that do? Yep, excellent. You're doing well. Ah uh, yeah, so we can expand the box for, for more information. There was also some blue text, which may be a little bit difficult to see there. Um, why is it different? How could I for, find out more information about that blue highlighted text? It's a link, that's right. So you can hover over it, click it, things like that. So what about mobile or cell phones? Um, how would I remove the themes icon and get rid of it from the home screen? Bingo. Yeah. Yes, you can tap and hold it and move it to the remote, remove icon when it shows up. So you can see in a graphical user interface, there are many ways to convey information and guide the user through the experience. So we can use icons or pictograms to give obvious hints. We can also use color to direct focus. Another great example is you know, graying out disabled buttons. Now I personally find the UX of tap and hold, just like this gentleman here, um, bad, because it's really hard to discover. I mean, once you know it's there, it's fine, but that first time is really frustrating. So what about CLI applications or command line interfaces? So let's imagine I've got this new CLI app. It's so amazing, I immediately download it and install it using Chocolatey. Can anyone tell me how I'd actually use this new CLI at all? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, discoverability in CLIs is really different and a lot harder than in GUIs. I mean, it even has a name, which is the uh, blinking cursor problem. So I'll be a little bit fairer. My new application is called Pineapple on Pizza. How can I get more information about Pineapple on Pizza? That's one way. That's another way, that's another way. Yeah. Enter. Enter. Yeah, there is like a whole host of ways of getting help about individual applications. There's no standard. Uh, when I was at Puppet, there's an actual issue where to get help, it's Puppet, help, 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 help. 
That is a real, that is a real thing, which is, which is crazy. It's getting help about the help about the help about the help. So there's competing standards of verb nouns and noun verb. So uh, here's an example of the Kubernetes CLI app. Uh, kubectl pod example pod one. So this resembles English, you know, basically. Get the pod called example pod one. Whereas Docker uses noun verb. So it's Docker plugin create. If it was verb noun, it would actually be Docker create plugin. Unless, of course, you want to start a container, in which case it is verb noun. Or if you'd like to get more information, in which case it's using Unixisms like PS and top. Or if you want to remove an image and it's using an abbreviation instead. To be clear, Docker isn't the only CLI app out there that uses different language standards and metaphors poorly. And it makes your context switch in your brain depending on the task you want to achieve, which leads to a more frustrating user experience. So we've all been there trying different combinations. This is this, no. This is this, no. This is this, no. So a quick aside here. Um, metaphors are a very important tool in user experience. Um, Eric Sorensen did a great talk called Mixing Metaphors for Fun and Profit. And he talks about some of the research uh, into how we interpret and use metaphors in our day-to-day -day life, and particularly in the IT space. He defines metaphors as a consequence of our brains reaching for metaphors to come to grips with the world around us. We gain partial understanding of experiences, and which parts we grasp versus which parts we elude us are determined by the metaphors that we use. So we use metaphors to fill gaps in our understanding when trying to convey ideas. But in true Eric style, he uses metaphors to describe metaphors. Did you even notice them? No. Metaphors are just so ingrained into us that we don't even see or hear them. And this will be important later on in the talk. So all of this UX stuff is nice to know, um, but I haven't shown you any documentation yet. So the question then is, is how does documentation fit into UX? And let's work through some scenarios. Imagine you've got this new gadget. Could be a new laptop, piece of software, new chair, coffee grinder, take your pick. You've got this new thing, you unwrap it, take all the plastic off, and then you realize you have no idea how to use this thing. So you reach for the documentation. So that documentation is meant to guide you through the first use of that product, from unwrapping and building or assembling. So here's two examples of that. You bought a new bookcase from Ikea. You get given it in flat pack formats which you have to assemble. And that assembly manual, the documentation, is part of the experience of using that bookcase. Now have a think about that. As soon as I showed this and I mentioned the word IKEA, did you have an emotional response to what I said? Yeah, you've heard or if you've done it or you've heard of other people struggling to assemble this stuff. So remember back to the definition of a user experience, beliefs and emotions before and after using that product. This document is truly part of the user experience. But consider this. As bad or good as the emotional response is, that document doesn't use a single word to describe how to assemble that flat pack bookcase, and yet it works. That, that document is being meticulously engineered to use icons and pictograms in just the right location, time, and tone. It doesn't matter what language you speak, or to some degree, how old you are. Another example. Who thinks a 420-page assembly manual could be fun? I did. I got the Ghostbusters Firehouse Lego set. Look how happy I was. Um, this set has over four and a half thousand pieces and is so much more complicated and intricate than a bookcase, but it shares some similarities. The documentation doesn't use words to describe how to assemble the firehouse, and yet it works. Again, that document has been meticulously engineered to use icons and pictograms in the right location, time, and tone. Doesn't matter what language you speak or how old you are, and that's very important with Lego because catering for children is really difficult. The user experience with Lego is paramount. But consider this. Why does a Lego manual have a different emotional response to an IKEA manual? Because in my opinion, the Lego manual is more than just assembly instructions. It has backstory, it has characters, it has information about who designed the set. Even the cover of the instructions isn't bland. It's telling a story, and we all love stories. So Lego is probably one of the most outstanding examples of documentation contributing to the overall user experience. So that's first use. What about a different scenario? You've got yourself that coffee grinder again. You've been using it for about a year. Plug it in one day, it doesn't turn on. What do you do? You reach for the documentation. You'll see there's a bit of a theme going on here. Uh, you inspect the grinder. Yep, you reach the documentation, go to the user manual, and you go and see what it says when the grinder doesn't work. A couple of other more examples. 
Uh, many dishwashers show an error code, but something goes wrong. You can look up that code in the manual to figure out how to fix it. These documents are in stark contrast to those first used documents. These things are boring and straight to the point, and that's exactly what you want when your dishwasher is broken. Another example for, for those that are old enough to remember, you ever turned on your desktop computer and just beeped at you and then turned off? <laughs> you may remember you know, putting your PC together, you put everything in, you put it in, and you have to listen to those beeps, and you have to go and consult that manual because those beeps mean something. Now this used to be in the motherboard documentation, although sadly that's no longer true. Now you have to go to the internet, which is hard when your computer is blank and is beeping at you. So user manuals are an important part of the user experience because eventually something will go wrong and people need to figure out how to diagnose what went wrong and fix it. Because if you don't, you'll just get the thing, you'll just chuck it in the garbage. So one last scenario, and quite a personal journey for me, quite literally. Um, I used to do a lot of amateur car racing, which of course meant working on my car's engine and the brakes and electronic systems. That is actually me, my CC Lancer at a local racetrack. Um, the manufacturer's service manuals were of utmost importance when I was modifying the car, particularly for electrical systems. Um, this car started out with just a 1.5 litre carby, ended up with a big block with an uh, electronic ignition and, and injection systems. Um, and it was really important when I was converting over to a modern engine computer, because without those manuals, it would make it really difficult to do so. I needed to make my car faster and more reliable. It was also important that the installation manual of the new parts, which is much like the first use stock first use documentation. They could tell us what the information we needed because those car service manuals are huge. So in each of these uh, three scenarios, first use, product failure, and making modifications, documentation was a key uh, ingredient of that user experience. But also the style of the documentation wasn't the same in each scenario because the context was different. Remember back to your UX definition, the, th the three factors that influence user experience is the user, the system, and the context of use. So now we know documentation is part of the UX, what does that mean for PowerShell? So let's have a look at how the uh, documentation contributes to the user experience with the same three scenarios. The first use scenario is actually where PowerShell really shines. Um, as you know, PowerShell has some rules about uh, guides, about how we can actually um, structure our commandlets. But most importantly, it's a consistent user experience. Unlike Docker, PowerShell for the most part is verb noun and displays warnings when the module authors don't abide by this. Uh, also, unlike other CLI examples, PowerShell has structured help, which you can use get using, get it, using get help. There's no need to guess a command or a parameter. It's always get help. But there's also places where documentation can help. Uh, when you're searching for the PowerShell module, the PowerShell gallery shows helpful descriptions of modules which could be interesting in using. You can then drill down to them to get even more detailed information. It even has a nice little project site link on the left-hand side, which is a bit hard to see, unfortunately. So you can get even more detailed information directly from the module authors. So just like here for the DBA Tools website. And all of that information in the PowerShell gallery is driven by the PowerShell documentation and module systems. So what about failures then? Well, get help may be the first thing they do. Another thing is, uh, is another example is actually in the unapproved warning that we saw before. This warning doesn't just say, you had a bad verb, good luck. The warning it shows is actionable. There's something you can do with it. Firstly, it tells you uh, how to find the commands that were approved by importing again with the verbose parameter. And it tells you where to find the list of approved verbs. And the approved verbs documentation is really, really good. I had that bookmarked for years. And actionable, war actionable warnings are what you want when, when you're trying to fix something. So what about when you want to modify a PowerShell module? Well, PowerShell itself doesn't really help here, unfortunately. It can certainly give you tips or clues where you can go to get more information. Um, typically, this would be from the project site link for the module on the gallery. This could take you to the, the source of the module or a, or a website where it tells you where the source is. For example, here's the readme for the DBA tools again, which then takes you to their website, which has a link to the co contributing guide for the DBA tools module. Not all roses, though. It is still possible to create a bad or a frustrating user experience through this documentation. Like having a command with so many parameters and parameter sets, it takes forever to scroll this through these things. Or my personal pet peeve is where the help is so obvious, it's useless. Um, here the help for the mode parameters, it's a mode. 
It's like, yep. The other parameters have lovely text descriptions. Why not the mode? So clearly documentation is part of the product's user experience, be that first use, failure, or trying to modify it, and show some brief examples of how that applies to PowerShell, which is nice, but nothing I've told you yet actually helps you create better docs. You can't, I can't just find bad examples and say, don't do that. So there should be a process or some guidelines that we can use to create documentation that doesn't suck. And fortunately, there is. Um, now, you may have noticed that there isn't the word documentarian or technical writer in my job title. I am a senior software engineer. So how does that make me qualified to speak about writing documentation? And it doesn't. There are probably much more qualified tech writers at this conference. In fact, is Sean? Or Sean isn't here. He said he was. I know there are much better and more prolific content um, producers out here as well. I am an average text docs writer. I've had the privilege of working with some phenomenal writers and they showed me how much I don't know about writing in the nicest possible way. But to be honest, this is not the point of my talk. The point of my talk is, is about you as a PowerShell script writer, how can I make your scripts better by treating the documentation as part of the overall experience? So let's take a look at an existing PowerShell module and work through the documentation process. This is the Platypus module uh, by the PowerShell team, and it's designed to generate PowerShell external help files from Markdown, licensed with MIT, it's open source with a GitHub repo. That's some existing documentation, but I think we can review it and see if we can make some improvements. Now, why did I choose this module? Um, honestly, I thought it'd be fun to document the documentation module, and it's named after a platypus, so of course I have to pick it because there are no kangaroo or koala modules on the gallery. So where do we start this process? We start at the beginning and ask some basic questions. The first thing we need to ask is, what do people want to achieve from our documentation and who should be reading it? These are important questions to think about because there's no point writing something that no one will read. And the goals people want to achieve don't have to be specific. In fact, they need to be, they can be very broad, like, I would like to know if I can even use the Platypus module on my computer. In fact, at this stage of the, of the documentation process, it is best to think more broadly. At the same time, you'll be considering who would want to, who, who are the kind of people that would like to read your documentation. Are they first-time PowerShell users? Are they fully experienced code ninjas? If you're writing for an internal module for work, are the people reading your documentation in your team? Are they in another IT team? Is it like audit or HR, which are not IT people? And just like the what question, it's best to keep this group quite broad. You can then put your answers and put them into a basic table like this. And hopefully you can read the bottom line, because I had trouble reading the back when I was in the back there. So this is the list of tasks and people that I thought the Platypus module would need. So on the left is what the people want to achieve. On the right is who would like to achieve this goal. So some of the tasks are figure out if they can use the module on their computer, learn something general about the module, perform a specific t uh, task with the module, find out why an error happened, or submit a bug report. and I found three groups of users that'll be reading the documentation. So we have first time users, so these people have never used Platypus before. We have returning inexperienced users, these people have just started using Platypus. And then we have experienced PowerShell users. So these are people that are very used to using PowerShell, but they may or may not have used Platypus before. And the table assigns the different types of users to different tasks. So now we can say that a returning inexperienced user will want to read documentation when trying to find out when an error happened. Some important things to remember about this table. It is not the list of every single task someone would ever want to achieve. Nor does it list every single type of person that will ever use your module for the rest of time. This table is not set in stone. It can change and that is all right. This table is just a guide that you can help to focus your attention so when you're writing documentation, it has the best chance of being useful for someone else. And later on, you may discover another group of important people. You can add them to the table, that's fine. Or you may find that one of those tasks isn't really important at all. Get rid of it, that's fine. This table also means you can show other people and get their opinion. You can get other points of view, which is actually really useful when you're writing documentation. But now you have this table, what's next? Well, if you want to, you can take it further with some other UX techniques like user stories, personas, and user journeys. So these techniques probably aren't required for most projects, but they're still kind of useful things to know about. 
So user stories are a nice way to rephrase items in the table and focus on why they want to achieve a task. You've probably seen these before in a common format, as a user, I want to perform a task so that I can achieve a goal. So here I've taken the can they use the module task from the table and converted it to a user story. In this example, notice that they would like to quickly find the module requirements. So making that document easily searchable is going to be important for that document. User personas is a technique to make the who list more detailed. It's like where you make up a character, giving them a real personality, which you can then use to dive into what the person wants to achieve. For example, we have Harper and Riley here who both work at a bank. One's in IT support, one's in the QA department. And because we know more about them, we can cater our documentation for their specific needs. For example, Riley's on a laptop. So we need to make sure that documentation is readable on smaller screens. And lastly, user journeys are probably the most advanced technique for documentation planning, and I don't think most people will use them, but it's still a, an interesting technique to have in the back of your head. So the Nielsen Norman group describes them as, in its most basic form, uh, journey mapping starts by compiling a series of user actions into a timeline. Next, the time zone, timeline is fleshed out with user thoughts and emotions to create a narrative, and then the narrative is condensed down and polished, ultimately leading to a visualization. So we can track how the user is feeling as they progress reading through our documentation. So we can take one of our tasks in our table and we can plot that. So let's say uh, the task for when they're trying to find out when an error happened. So initially the person will be frustrated. They search our documentation. They find an article that kind of describes the error and the ways to fix it. They try it, it doesn't work. The user is more frustrated. They search again, they find a different document which fixes it and now they're happy. This is a gross simplification of the process, but the idea is you can then look for opportunities in the journey to fix frustrations and remove entire steps to get people happier sooner. But even without those advanced techniques, we still have the table as a guide. We know who our users will be and what they want to achieve, so it's time to start get writing and figure out what type of documentation we need to write. And that's right, folks, unlike an immortal Highlander, there can indeed be more than one type of documentation. Remember back to the Lego assembly manual books and the service manuals? Those documents are indeed different types. A uh, far better documentarian than me, uh, Mikey Lombardi, was about, here about five years ago telling us about rightfully writing the right things. Um, he says there are three types of documentation, reference, conceptual, and narrative. But there are many uncount uncountable forms of each. So we'll quickly go through these three. Uh, so the first type is reference documentation, which is most common, explains the technical details of your PowerShell code, and if it's missing, it's unforgivable. If the author of your PowerShell code can't even document its parameters, why would anyone want to run it in production? But it's not enough. The reference documentation doesn't document the whole user experience. Next, we have conceptual documentation. So concept docs is the least common type that, you, that you'll see, but if you want a good user experience, they are required because concept docs answer specific questions that someone will ask about your PowerShell module. Why does the, how, sorry, why does the PowerShell module solve the problem in this way? Did we consider, consider using a different language or approach? Some more important questions. How would I set up this PowerShell module in a more secure environment? Classic examples, how would I use secrets in this PowerShell module? When shouldn't I use this module? I mean, this is a question that not many people answer in their documentation. Or well, how is this module architectured? Because for bigger modules, say things like DBA tools, it has a large number of commandlets with a huge surface area. How is the module structured internally to make sense of it all? And lastly is narrative documentation. So they explain uh, how and why a user would do a task, and these tasks mostly align to all of those tasks I had on the table there. The difference is though, they come in the format of a story. You know, first there was a problem, then they started making progress, and then there was a setback, then they solved the problem and everything was happy. And because it's a story, it's the most effective type of documentation because humans are basically hardwired to remember stories. So it also guides the user to the generally correct way of doing things. So if a user was just fumbling around looking for information, they're likely to read and remember your story and get it right the first time without too much effort. So there may only be three types of documentation, but they can take many forms. I mean, as users, we tend to read reference documentation with get help, be it within the console or via online link to a web page. 
We'll also read module specific reference, inf reference information like minimum PowerShell version, which is in the module's PSD file. Um, or when getting help about the module and the console. These are the places where users are expecting to find in-depth technical but bland information. Conceptual documentation, on the other hand, tends to be found in the source repository for the module, typically in the readme file. For example, the Platypus module has a section in the readme called Why, which explains why the module exists and what the problem it solves. However, you can also find conceptual information in many of the about topics. For example, the about functions topic de de yeah, describes in great detail how functions work within PowerShell. Narrative documentation tends to be found in the module's readme. Good examples are the Getting Start Guides or Quick Starts. The PowerShell gallery may have some as well. But the bulk of narrative documentation tends to be on external sites. It could be blogs, use about using a module or videos or even conference talks like this. So those are Mikey's three types of documentations. Um, there is also a really good book, which I'm going to show you in a second. Um, Docs for Developers. I've got my copy up here if you want to have a look at it a bit later. Um, you can also buy it from the usual bookstores. I don't get a cut or anything like that. It has the byline of most of us have to learn the importance of documentation the hard way by finding it missing when we need it the most. Um, this book is a great read and takes you through the whole process, and I mean the whole process of documenting your product. It also actually teaches you applying a product mindset to your PowerShell. But for us, though, it has the same types of documentation as Mikey mentioned, with a couple of interesting additions. So the authors have reference documentation. They flesh out, they add a few things like a glossary. So if we're using lots of acronyms, that's a good place to put it. Um, also some troubleshooting information. Uh, it also includes change logs and release notes. We also have conceptual documentation just like before. Interesting though, the book chose to use the word procedural documentation instead of narrative. Um, again, procedural docs choose things like tutorials or how-to guides, which generally follow a story style. But the getting started documents are a bit different, and I can understand why. So getting started guides have a very specific goal. They're trying to get someone from knowing nothing about your product all the way to they feel that they're happy that they can do something with the product. And these guys need to be small enough so it doesn't feel overwhelming, but big enough so the reader doesn't get lost. And it's a really tricky balance to get right. But the next two types of documentation, being readme's, which we covered already, and code comments. Seems strange to include code comments there. Why are they there? Over the past couple of years or so, the term developer experience, or DX, uh, for short, has been becoming quite common. And DX is basically user experience, but for a specific type of user, the developer, or the person who writes or maintains the PowerShell code. It doesn't have to be a group of people, you can just be a single person. Um, who here has written some PowerShell, and then six months later you look at it and you go, what the hell was that? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, you just had a bad developer experience. Um, there are many feelings about code comments. Um, some people say your PowerShell will be self-documenting and doesn't require them. I personally feel that code comments used correctly reduce a lot of confusion, particularly in high stress situations like outages. Comments should be brief, relevant, and to the point. Other examples of developer experience are variable and function names. Remember I talked about uh, metaphors. Using mixed metaphors in your names makes it harder for people to understand what you're trying to achieve. Using the correct metaphor means people understand your PowerShell sometimes without even thinking about it. So now we know about DX, uh, we need to update our documentation table and add in a missing task. We'll put it down the bottom. Apologies down the back, you may not be able to see that last line, but trust me, I did actually add something. One of the most common complaints I get from new contributors is how do I run tests? So I added that task down the bottom. So remember I said this table is not set in stone, we can add stuff and it's okay. So now we have a better list, we know about the three types of documentation, now we can actually start writing. You stare into the blank paper, or whatever you're using, nothing comes to you. Um, firstly, try not to get frustrated here. Writing doesn't come easy for some, especially not me. This is why we have this table of tasks and groups of people. To help us think outside of our own head. And secondly, there are many places we can draw on to get information that we can write about. Um, chat, like Slack or Discord or IRC if you're old school, or whatever your internal chat service is at work, can be a really good source of information. Uh, people ask a question in there, and then the hive mind eventually comes back with an answer. Could be instant, could be days. 
Point is, though, uh, what if instead of asking other people, they could just like read the docs? That'd be great. Uh, email, much like chat, is where a lot of information is traded, but it's typically more one-to-one. -one. So a good gauge of whether something should be documented is, have I ever needed to explain this thing more than twice? So more than once, sorry. Um, if the PowerShell module that you're documenting is for private use, like something your team uses at work, internal knowledge bases, like wikis, Confluence, and SharePoint, Google Groups, can be an absolute treasure trove of information, although I do jokingly call Confluence the place where wisdom goes to die. Because it's really hard to find. <laughs> but that doesn't mean your PowerShell documentation can't cross-reference it. Why write new documentation if it's already out there? If the PowerShell module you're trying to document is for public use, forums like Stack Overflow got a heap of information. It's actually searchable. You can take some of it and use it when you're crafting your documentation. It's also a good validation tool to see what people actually need to know about that. Issue trackers like Jira, ServiceNow, GitHub issues contain information on users' pain points. But more importantly, how it was solved. It's also, and again, another good validation tool to ensure what you're writing about is things that people want to know. Then there are meta documents, which are documents that describe your documents. There are things like commit logs and change logs, because you are using change control for your PowerShell, aren't you? Or PowerShell tests, because you are testing your PowerShell, aren't you? Because tests are a form of documentation. They describe how your PowerShell has changed over time and how your PowerShell should behave. Or for some complete heresy, you could actually ask humans instead of using technology to ask them for ideas and validation. But these are all good locations of source information to help you write your documentation for your PowerShell. So now we're ready to write. We sit down and write our storm of prose worthy of Hemingway and Shakespeare themselves. But what do we do with it? Where do we put this documentation? And unfortunately, the answer is, as a consultant previously, it depends. Some documents may be easy, like readme's. I personally, I prefer my reference documentation to be the same repository as my PowerShell code. Some people don't. If your work mandates that all of your documentation has to be in SharePoint, then it has to go there. If it contains sensitive information, then it should be hidden behind authentication. But there are three things you should probably consider when you're publishing your documentation. Are you late, Mr. Wheeler? Documents need to be findable, readable, and changeable. If you can't find the document, then no one's going to read it. If you're using a central document store like SharePoint or Confluence, make sure you use labels and tags liberally. Cross-reference from other documents. Make it more discoverable. Next, if you can't read the document, then obviously no one's going to read it. I mean, I personally prefer to use Markdown to write my documents, but not everything renders Markdown nicely or even the same. If your documentation is the public internet, try reading it on a large screen and a small phone screen, because can both users actually read that same document? But you may also consider creating the document in different formats, like PDF or HTML, to make it easier for people to read, although doing that usually isn't required. And lastly, and I feel the most forgotten part, is your, document should, your documents should be changeable. Information changes. People change, concepts change, and so too should your documentation. There should be a process for people to submit and track changes to your documentation over time. This is why I personally prefer to use the Markdown and Git workflow wherever I can. So now we know uh, we need to write the documentation, idea where to put it. Let's show you what the documentation for the Platypus module could look like and apply some of the things we talked about. Um, unfortunately, I can't do a live demo because of conference internet, it's not great. Um, but you can browse for it right now at https sidedev slash platypus. Um, the P and the S have to be capital. Unfortunately, the URL is case sensitive. Um, we already had the source for the module in Git, GitHub, so it made it easy to use GitHub pages to host our documentation. And this is basically a free static website offered by GitHub. We can also then use GitHub Actions to automate the process. So again, uh, this is a free CI service offered by GitHub. OK, so um, now we know how we'll publish the content. How do we generate it in the first place? Well, it turns out the nice people at Microsoft have a documentarian module in development, which includes a theme for the popular Hugo website generator called DoxyPosh. So we can use the same generator and theme that Microsoft is developing with our PowerShell code. 
So much like our software pipeline, we can stitch all of these tools together and create a documentation pipeline. And after less than a day's effort, I ended up with this. A pleasant looking PowerShell themed website with a big call to action right in the middle called Learn More, which we can then click on, which takes us immediately to a bunch of guidelines about Platypus. Um, can everyone read that properly? I can't actually increase it, but if you want to, you can come to the front. Um, front and center is a brief summary of what Platypus is. Then uh, we have a quick start guide to get users up and running quickly. There's a concept guide about why you'd want to use this module and what scenarios this module should be used. All readily available and easy to find. But remember, I said that documentation should be findable, readable, and changeable. How is this document changeable? So up the top right there, there are two links um, where you can edit the page on GitHub or at least create a GitHub issue if there's something wrong. But what about the compiler information? Or where's the other reference documentation? Well, right at the top there, then you can click on the word module to get information about the module, or you can use search, because Hugo can actually generate a search index for you, which means all of your documentation is now searchable. So the module reference documentation includes all the commandlets, uh, some schema concept doc documentation, and the module's changelog. And the commandlet information should look very familiar that anyone's actually used PowerShell help before. So now we have the basics of a documentation website. Let's quickly check if it covers all of the tasks that we had in our original uh, table there. So almost all of the tasks are now available on our new documentation website. Users can get quick information from guide section. We have concept and advanced, advanced concepts in their own pages. It is all searchable. We have links to submit bug reports on the pages, although we can add more information to the landing page later. I haven't added any error information yet, so that's like a to-do that I have to do after this talk. But let's dive a little further into how this documentation pipeline works. Um, you should better read that fine. There's a single GitHub action which is triggered whenever a change is merged into the main branch. Um, this action uses Platypus to generate all of the commandlet markdown files. So yes, I'm using Platypus to document Platypus. We then trigger Hugo to build the website. It takes the generated markdown files, the static documentation we already have in the repo. So that's things like changelog, quick start guides. And then generates the website and applies the doxyposh theme. And the GitHub action that takes that website and then publishes it on GitHub pages for us. Um, this is all in the workflow file. I do have reference slides at the end, so you can take pictures of that. But you actually get to see that, how this all works in a single file. What this means, though, is all of our documentation, you can now control through version control, and it'll be automatically published with little effort. But I went two steps further. Um, remember the, I mentioned developer experience. How can we make it easier for people to contribute to our documentation? Well, first we needed faster feedback. It's too late to merge a documentation change only to see your glorious typo published for all to see. And because VS Code is the preferred editor for this project, I added a task that can run the Hugo service locally. So if you have Hugo installed, you can build the docs website on your local computer and view the changes immediately. So you can make very fast changes to your documentation and see how they'll look straight away. But not everyone has VS Code or Hugo installed. So I improved the GitHub pull request experience on GitHub by adding a service called Netlify. Who's anyone used Netlify or heard of it? Just one, two, okay. So Netlify has a huge list of features, and the one that I was interested in was preview builds. So this feature will generate a preview of the documentation website whenever a GitHub pull request is created. This means when someone wants to make a change to the documentation, Netlify will generate the documentation website with a unique URL that we can look at prior to merging the changes, which makes it easier for both the contributor and the maintainer to actually see what is going to be on the website before we even merge that. And then Netlify puts a you know, nice little URL down the bottom, which I've highlighted there, that you can just go and click straight away. There's a lot more we could do to improve the, the developer experience here, but these two are a really good start. So all up, um, setting that up from just a source Platypus repo took a day using free open source tools. And that was really just the foundation. If I was the, an actual Platypus module author, I'd actually finish up the error documentation, then revisit my task table and see what other things users need. But please remember, what I'm showing you today is just one way of actually doing this. There are many ways to actually generate documentation pipelines, and I really would actually like to hear what, you, what your ideas on how we can do it differently. So wrapping up, uh, 
documentation plays an important part of both the user and the developer experience of your PowerShell. Sure, you can live without it, but it has the power to take your PowerShell code and modules to the next level to make it an enjoyable experience to use your PowerShell no module, not something that your users have to tolerate. And even though writing documentation may not come naturally, there are processes and resources out there which I've gone through today which will hopefully help you on your documentation journey. Now, I don't expect any of you to become documentarians overnight or even at all, but I'm excited to see what documentation you create next, possibly tomorrow at 2 p.m. and Thursday for the Dockathon. Hint, hint. Thank you very much. Um, put the speaker ratings down the bottom. I've got my link to the actual site, and in a few seconds, I'll put up the resource slide so you can all take a photo of that. But in the meantime, I'm happy to take questions. So the question is, is how can we motivate, let's say, managers and leaders, how we can actually see the value in documentation? That is a really hard question. Um, I know I can, certainly, I can certainly express it in the negative, which is you can show them all of the people complaining about your documentation or people driving away from using your product. Um, how many people actually do public modules and you produce them for a company versus internal? Who's internal? Write stuff internal? Yeah. Who writes public? Okay, do your internal users, do they have a choice? Yeah. So that's a problem. If they have no choice, there is no incentive to make this documentation. However, just, I can't give you a straight answer for this because I don't know how to make it easy because it's a sociological problem. Talk to your users, feel their pain. Get the management to talk to their users. Get the user to talk to the management, even better. Get them to complain about it. Yeah. The impetus to break into documentation on a private module is they don't consult you all the time. Yes. That is, that is also a negative, in, a kind of <laughs> negative thing to actually encourage people by, uh, yeah, stop people bugging you. Anything else? If you do, I do actually have a local copy if you want to come and play with it. I've got the book up here if you want to come and read it. It's a really good book. I'll be around all conference, so come and see me if you want. Thank you very much. <laughs>